être assis sur la cinquième fortune mondiale, gérer un réseau de 2 milliards d'utilisateurs et se sentir tout petit parfois dans la vie. C'est un Mark Zuckerberg tendu, parfois livide, qui s'est présenté cette nuit devant les sénateurs américains. 4h30 à répondre au feu croisé des questions. Monsieur Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um, uh, no. If you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world. The Senate did not force a reckoning. The Senate performed theater. They were going to play a check to Facebook by yelling and screaming and telling them that they were wrong, by shaming them, because that's what they know how to do. They had no political will to think about regulations, so they just wanted to publicly shame. I say this gently. Your user agreement sucks. <laughs> Mr. Zuckerberg, in many ways, you and the company that you created, the story that you created represent the American dream. Many are incredibly inspired by what you've done. At the same time, you have an obligation, and it's up to you. So we have made a lot of mistakes in running the company. I think it's, it's pretty much impossible, I, I believe, to start a company in your dorm room and then grow it to be at the scale that we're at now without uh, making some mistakes. And because auditions, During these hearings, he appeared, and was even mocked for it, as almost catatonic and cold. There was this sense of a robotic and chilling coldness about him, while also appearing like a child caught in the act. It seemed as if he had never fully grasped the magnitude of the monster he had created. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. Ugh. The smallness of that apology, next to the harms that his company has caused, is, is mind-blowing. Most of Zuckerberg's apologies, I would say, are not very sincere. His apologies, when he makes them, are generally a PR exercise to try to take criticism down and to try to keep the heat off his company. And I find that very tragic. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. So now, we have to go through our, all of our relationship with people and make sure that we're taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. He said he'd fix Facebook, which is first and foremost an admission of failure, something that is never easy for an engineer. Is Facebook even repairable? That's the question. Did any of these individuals ever stop to ask themselves why Facebook don't charge for access? Nothing in life is free. At least here in the United States, m most government officials don't have the slightest idea how the internet works technologically and have no way of, of challenging it. And have, have, you know, when Zuckerberg spoke before Congress, I was ashamed. I was ashamed for my Congress. Well, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. If my Congress was that ignorant and let him say those things that casually, without pushing him, pushing him, pushing him, we have a problem. I think in total you apologize now 15 or 16 times the last decade. In 2003 you started. Every year you have one or other wrongdoing or problem with Facebook and 
and you have to face the reality and to say sorry and to say that you're going to fix it. Last year, I think it was twice that you apologized, and this year, you, three times already, and we are still in the month of May, so it's a little bit early. You've got a fantastic model that generates a lot of money. From time to time, there's a small issue, you apologize for it, and then you move on without changing anything. You have to ask yourself what, how you will be remembered. As one of the three big internet giants, together with Steve Jobs, I should say, and Bill Gates, who have enriched our world and our societies? Or on the other hand, in fact, a, a genius who created a, a digital monster that is destroying our democracies and our societies for the moment. That's a question that you have to put yourself for yourself. Perhaps he was a bit shocked, but you couldn't tell. I must say, when I looked at him, he seemed emotionless. There wasn't much emotion there at all. And that's what scared me. Because he runs the most influential platform in our democratic society, with no emotion at all, apparently. On a more personal note, I, I really think we have a big problem here. And it's not solved by saying we're going to fix it ourselves. So in the end, politicians must know that these sorts of hearings aren't going to fix the problem. What's going to fix the problem and save our democracy is regulation and changing the model. You can't let Facebook decide how to regulate Facebook. The responsibility of establishing guidelines and rules that these platforms must follow lies with the state or the governments to ensure that public discourse remains protected and continues to operate freely in our democracy. In December 2018, I got a phone call from the French president's chief of staff. He told me that Mark Zuckerberg had agreed to let Facebook be a test subject for the French government's regulatory experiment. It was a sort of role play where we were going to be the regulators, essentially regulating Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg and Emmanuel Macron decided to experiment within a new framework of public-private partnership to what is known as the Luttrell mission. It's hard to create a law that's suitable for these large digital platforms, given how new they are. The issue is that they are so widespread. How do you regulate a platform that operates in every country in the world, when traditionally laws have been made on a national level? The second challenge with regulating these platforms is that they're hard to watch over. To understand what a platform is up to, you would need to be able to watch over the entirety of Facebook, which we simply can't do. I mean, when we first met with Benoit Luttrell and, and the team, essentially they, they wanted to put on the table all of the questions and concerns that they had, what they, they thought would be interesting and useful. They wanted to understand how our policies worked, how we made decisions. The initial meetings were surreal. There were lawyers, product specialists, platform experts, and a global public affairs director in attendance. Gradually, we put them at ease and explained that it was just a game by reassuring them and showing them that the magistrate wasn't going to send them to prison and the commander of the gendarmerie wasn't going to handcuff them. We were able to break the ice. After a few days, the atmosphere relaxed and we could sense that they were taking more risks and were willing to engage in a dialogue. You can never make a right decision. You know, whatever you do as Facebook, if you take more content down, someone criticizes you for censorship. If you leave more content up, someone's going to criticize you uh, for creating a dangerous environment. You can never get this right. Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg had instructed his teams to answer all of our questions. While we did receive answers, we had no way of verifying their accuracy. Essentially, we only knew what Facebook was telling us, and we had no independent means of verifying that information. Ensuring platform accountability requires the ability to conduct through audits, which includes access to server and algorithm data. But gaining access to this data is a contentious issue at the center of ongoing debates. Do we want our digital public spheres controlled by these very peculiar men with almost no oversight from anyone else? And I think for me, the answer is very simple. 
the public should control the public square. And we're enormously far away from that state. My name is Frances Haugen. I used to work at Facebook. Qui a travaillé plus de deux ans pour le réseau social le plus utilisé dans le monde. Elle a donc fait ses cartons, mais avec des milliers de documents confidentiels pour devenir lanceuse d'alerte. The documents I have provided to Congress prove that Facebook has repeatedly misled the public about what its own research reveals about the safety of children, the efficacy of its artificial intelligence systems, and its role in spreading divisive and extreme messages. What she says is that the social media has encouraged the attack of the Capitol, that if the militants of the extreme right have invaded the American parliament, it's because the algorithms not only don't censure their appeals to the hate, but they have put in front of the files of actuality of the users. Breaking news, the president, President Trump, has been banned indefinitely from Facebook and Instagram, and at least until the end of his presidency. Weirdo, he's a weirdo, Mark Zuckerberg came to the White House, kissed my ass. <laughs> kissed my ass. Sir, I'd love to have dinner. Sir, I'd love to have dinner. I'd love to bring my lovely wife. Here's my message for Mark Zuckerberg. Your time of invading our privacy, promoting toxic content, and preying on children and teens is over. Far away from the California sunshine, Facebook has been handed a multi-million dollar fine that will force it to rethink its business model in Europe. The social media company suffered a major defeat in an EU court being fined 390 million euros, 210 million euros in relation to Facebook and an additional 180 million euros in relation to Instagram. La cour donne raison à un juriste autrichien qui avait lancé cette procédure de contestation. Advertising practices have been ruled illegal under EU law. The decision could have major consequences for the business's advertising model, requiring the company to make costly changes. Mark is an innovator. Mark is a creator. I have never met an innovator or a creator who likes working on the same product for years and years and years and years. 20 years doing the same thing over and over again? That's not appealing to anybody with that mindset. Facebook's boring. First of all, it's mostly used by old people. Even Instagram is mostly used by older people. It is not young and hip like TikTok or Snapchat. It is what parents and grandparents use to stay in touch with one another. In many ways, he's trapped. So he's looking for a new path. We believe the metaverse will be the successor to the mobile internet. We'll be able to feel present, like we're right there with people, no matter how far apart we actually are. Finally, the metaverse is Zuckerberg telling you that he's bored with Facebook. It's the simplest way to say it. This is some of the most exciting stuff that I've ever gotten to work on, and I'm just incredibly energized to be on this journey with all of you. He doesn't want the company to be called Facebook anymore because Facebook is boring, and for him, the metaverse is interesting. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Metaverse. What even is the Metaverse? Un univers entièrement virtuel. The Metaverse is what's next. Meta is an alternative reality. Of course they want to work on something fun and new and exciting. And they want to get back into the place where the media coverage is like, wee! We're back to the same super hyper excitable media coverage. That is enticing. He immediately shifted the discussion towards his vision of the future, where people can attend office meetings dressed up as unicorns or ponies. 
I'm not sure that was the kind of disruption the world was anticipating. $27 billion, that's how much they're expected to jump in cost in 2022. You should be able to take your avatar and virtual goods everywhere that you go. A future where, with just a pair of glasses, you will be able to step beyond the physical world and into the kinds of experiences that we have talked about today. Ever since certainly the 1990s, we've been promised that virtual reality was just around the corner, it would be possible to live in a virtual world, and that promise has never quite come true. Do we want to live in a world that's virtual 24-7? I don't think so. Facebook, as you know from using it, is littered with advertisements. It's always tracking you and always helping to market things that it thinks you need. Imagine what a world would be like in which you don't see just your friends, but Coca-Cola can put a Coca-Cola can over on your table, make you thirsty. That's the metaverse dream. Um, but I think it's a, it's a horrible dream. It's a, it's a nightmare. I can't tell yet whether it's an extension of the earlier Facebook vision or a colossal mistake. I think failure is a likelihood. I think the question is, what do we mean by failure? Shares of Facebook parent Meta have been pummeled this year. A year ago, Mark Zuckerberg bet the entire company on the metaverse concept. Today, shares of Meta down 65% on the year, in part because investors are unhappy with the tens of billions of dollars lost trying to build an experiment that may not pay off for a decade, if it ever does at all. Companies in Silicon Valley thrive on constantly pursuing new projects. And if they can't fulfill their promises, they start to go around in circles. They wear themselves out and then turn into these economic monstrosities that are just there to suck up profit and no longer inspire people's dreams. Got some breaking news just crossing. Facebook parent Meta will begin laying off workers this morning. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announcing just moments ago that the workforce will be reduced by about 13 percent. That equates to about 11,000 workers. I want to say, you know, up front, uh, that I take full responsibility for this decision. Um, you know, I'm the founder and CEO. I'm uh, responsible for for the health of our our company, um, for our direction, um, and for for deciding you know, how we execute that, including things like this. And this was ultimately my call, um, and it was it was you know one of the hardest calls that I've I've had to make in 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 the 18 years of running the company. Since September 2021, Zuckerberg lost more than half of his fortune, a staggering $76.8 billion. He's got many lives. We don't know what those next ones will be. But if I were making any bets, he's not looking to make lots more money. He's looking to make lots more impact. Désormais, il va falloir payer pour avoir un compte certifié sur Facebook et Instagram. Mark Zuckerberg announced Meta Verified and now charge users for a verified account. It means the blue check mark badges will cost $15 a month to get one of those verified accounts. Lancé en 2004, le slogan de Facebook a longtemps été « c'est gratuit » et ça le restera toujours. On en est loin maintenant. Et entre l'inflation qui fait baisser les budgets des annonceurs et la concurrence féroce d'applications comme TikTok, Mark Zuckerberg veut faire rentrer de l'argent. Does Zuckerberg get to go down with the ship? Does he finally step down at a moment where Facebook is no longer particularly relevant and he's ridden the whole arc of Facebook as a significant force in the world. Those feel like real possibilities to me. I think what's interesting is with these tech companies, everybody cares about the head, like in this case, Zuckerberg. Um, I think that's not relevant. It's a stock company, after all, um, that makes money, that has certain machineries within it. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is oftentimes also a myth. There's this kind of the myth of the organizer, the one that founded it, and so on. It's not that Mark came out trying to be a king. It's that everybody wanted to put him on that pedestal. We focus all of our attention on, is Mark good? Is Mark bad? Did Mark do the right thing? Did he not? It's not about Mark anymore. You seem like a natural. Whoa. That's a little too, too realistic. See you later, Lee. Perhaps what society is trying to tell us today is that this isn't what we need. When you consider the challenges we face when it comes to the environmental crisis, 
is encouraging Silicon Valley to manufacture new innovations where they make more promises really the most desirable and necessary thing for society? I don't think so. Then I hope that you will join us because the future is going to be beyond anything we can imagine.